All right, episode three, we're on. So welcome back, Eddie. Thanks yeah. for coming back. Good stuff. Yeah, it's, excited. Uh, I can't believe that uh, I went to Saudi Arabia and back already since the last time we recorded. Seems like just a few uh, days I went ago. to North Carolina Did and you? came back. So. Okay. What were you doing in North Carolina? I had a work trip there for four days. I uh, hooked up with some some guys from the, the Lifetime in Cary, North Carolina, and they set me up with some really fun games. Mm-hmm. Uh, the local pro there, Stuart, shout out to Stuart. Uh, and his crew, Bob and Kevin, Pablo, and uh, one of their local players, Jeremiah. We had a good time for a couple of days and some really strong games. It's a lot of fun. Well, it was, it was Lifetime, you said? Yeah, Lifetime. I mean, it's so great to be able to go to any place in pretty much the country. Mm-hmm. There's, there's probably going to be a Lifetime close by, and right. most of them have pickleball at this point, if not all of them. And it's great to have that network available. What's your job? Yeah, so I work for the National Institutes of Health. Okay. Um, there's 27 institutes all focusing on different um, aspects of health, and mine is the um, Institute for Environmental Health Science. So all the things in our environment that can affect health, mm-hmm. um, air, water, mm-hmm. soil, those types of things. Um, so we have a big campus in North Carolina, several thousand people, hundreds of acres, and my job is to help run a lot of the amenities. So we have Two fitness centers, we have a child care center, cafeteria, mm-hmm. motor pool, mail service. It's kind of like running a little town, and my team helps manage all of those things. We even have a pickleball court Fantastic. on campus. You know, um, so I do archaeology, and we also are kind of – we dovetail with – the environmental sciences and environmental regulations. So maybe you deal with archaeologists also? Maybe some of our staff do. I okay. Don't, I don't know. Okay, nice. I well, picture you out in the field digging up bones, but uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what it means to be an archaeologist. Yeah. Well, my my trip to Saudi was also a work trip, and I won't get too much into it, but uh, I'd, I'd run a, I ran a prehistoric survey for the kingdom, and and uh, it's through a third party. My my the company I work for is a private company based here in the U.S. But uh, we're finding fantastic stuff, and we've we did the field work last year, end of last year, and I went back this time to study the stone tools. That's that's my specialty, stone tool analysis. So I, I looked at all the stone tools, measured them, geeked out on them, as you can imagine. But yeah, it's. It's cool going to Saudi. Like I've I've been all around Saudi um, on previous trips, uh, research posts, and that sort of thing. I spent a lot of time in Israel, but I never had never been to Saudi. And then we started getting projects there last year, and uh, it's a really it, it's it's such a different country for the Middle East because there's no there's no tourism tourism no tourism industry, so not. Everything is oriented around, you know, getting tourists to come and buy stuff in their shops right. and, and they could care less. So it was really cool actually to see that in, in the Middle East. Is there a pickleball scene? Zero pickleball Zero. scene. But, you know, I, I did – so I went to the uh, squash courts at the Jetta Hilton Hotel and drilled – got a drill session in while I was while I was in Saudi Arabia. Any passersby take a look and – just ask you questions about like what that is. And- no, I was in there. It's kind of in the back in the okay. basement, and, and nobody saw. So uh, the guy looked at me kind of funny that I asked to, to, for a towel. He's like looking at my paddle. But they also, like I said last time, they have padel there. They have padel courts at the hotel. So it's not not too out of the ordinary. Uh, funny though, funny little story before we start into the latest news and gear stuff. But uh, it's. Like they're very much a night culture, as you can imagine, it being so hot in the summer. It's, it was perfect temperatures there while I was there in the winter, you know, highs in the 60s, you know, a little cool at night. But uh, things stay open until like midnight usually. But I can never get a sense and nobody really knows either. Like when things are open, when things are closed, you know, there's, there's, they're closed for prayer and, and they're closed at certain times during the day, but it's never consistent on which days. So uh, – I was out by myself, and I went out to dinner, and, and their main dish in Saudi Arabia is chicken and rice. It's like rotisserie-style chicken on a big bed of rice. They serve you this obscene amount of rice. I don't know how I can eat it all. But I was, I was hungry, went out to dinner. Uh, I think it was right, right when I got there. I was going to meet the rest of the crew, but I was by myself. Went to this restaurant, and the restaurants are laid out where there's kind of a cash register you order, and then there's a separate room where you go and sit down, and they have like a communal rug you can sit on, and then they have 
uh, tables and chairs you can sit on. So I went in, and there were a couple other people while I was there, got my food, I opened up my phone, checking emails, noticed the other people, you know, finished their meals and left, but I was just there, you know, eating my food, lights were on and everything. I finished my meal, uh, washed my hands, walk out into the main area where I paid. It's pitch black, nobody's there. I'm the only person in the <laughs> store. And I'm like, what? So, so uh, I had already paid. I paid when I went in. And I go to leave, and the door is locked, and there's no way to open it. You have to have the key, right? And I'm like, what do I do? And I look out, and the, the guy that, that took my order is, like, walking arm in arm down the road with his buddy. So I, like, pound on the glass. <laughs> and I pound on the glass, and he finally sees me. I'm yelling. He finally sees me, and he's just, just like, what? And I'm like, I'm locked in. I can't get out. And... It's, so I'm pointing at the door. He just goes, he's pointing in the back. And I'm like, what? And I shout, and nobody's out back there. He's, and he just gives me the signal, like, walk out the back. I'm like, Like okay. you're supposed to know that? <laughs> right. So I start walking, and it's like this labyrinth of a restaurant in the back. At one point, I walk by this dude that's, like, sleeping on a, on a, on a table. He's, like, legitimately asleep. It's 8 o'clock at night. Like, I don't know what. <laughs> maybe he's taking a nap. And I finally find my way out, and there's, like, this little back alley, and I'm kind of lost. <laughs> I'm like, what? The, the guy that took my order, <laughs> imagine, you know, taking some of the guy's order and being like, he'll figure it out. Right. I'm just going to lock the doors, and he'll figure out how to, to find his way out the back of the restaurant. It was nuts. I, I am back. <laughs> in one piece. No issues with TSA in your... <laughs> <laughs> they did not take my paddle this time. No I even look at it. Oh, by the way... Um, we just saw that uh, the Pickleball Studio posted their their first podcast after being on break today. So Eddie and I just saw the podcast today, and it just so happens that a lot of the material that they covered is in our show notes that we passed around yesterday. So uh, even though it may seem like we're going to be copying Will and Chris on this, it's uh, not the case. Well, I guess the solution to this problem is we just have to get ours out first. <laughs> get ours out. Well, <laughs> that's not going to happen. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think they record over the weekend or late in the week and then post theirs hey, on I'm Monday. I'm up for it if you are. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll touch on the same things. It'll be fun. You know, it's kind of like we're all one big podcast talking about I the same stuff. I think it's great. All right. So uh, PPA Desert Ridge. One of the first things I want to talk about is the new serve rule. So they, they, they pushed it out. It was Masters, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. So the first, first time they pushed it out was Masters. And it was a test to see if it would work. And the back backstory to this is: Did you watch the match between Ben and Colin facing Deckel and Tyson? Mm-mm. I think that was at Masters. This is what instigated it all. So, Deckel serves this big Deckel serve, and Colin was like, "Oh my god!" And it was like way too high, and he complained about it. Deckel serves another serve. Colin barely got it back, and it led to you know Deckel and Tyson winning that point. Colin raises a stink with the with the referee again, and they, they go back and they call. They look at I think they look at the tape and call Deckel on the serve. Anyway, you know Tyson's serve is, is right on the borderline too. And then Ben starts serving illegally on purpose, just because they weren't calling you know Deckel and, and Tyson for what they thought for were illegal serves. And then it's they're they're all serving like nipple high. It it becomes a spectacle. It's it's crazy. Even even Colin tried to serve and he like hit into the net. It wasn't even that hard. But but Ben was just smacking his serves and it was it was crazy. At one point the, the referees finally started calling it. So after that, I think that's what instigated the whole rule change. So the, the new rule is you, you you have to drop the serve from your waist. It's not a drop serve where you bounce it. It's a volley serve, but you can you can only you can only drop it. You can't throw it up. You can only drop it, and it has to be at your, down. at your pelvis or below. And I didn't – like so many people got called on it in the first tournament they rolled out at. And even Ben, you know, I think, kind of instigated it or wanted it, originally call, got called a lot on the series on that first tournament. And he, he was saying, well, I'm not throwing the ball up. I'm throwing it out. And then that became an issue. Like, is it illegal to, to throw it out a little further or just drop it? He's not even explaining it, but I imagine he wants to be able to to swing, to rotate his hips a little more. Because when it's when you're dropping at hip level, you got to kind of – anyway, I feel like Ben 
even now looks very awkward. It's very much kind of got that Salome de Vize serve now. Where it's I'd open say a stance. bunch of the pros look awkward even in, during this last tournament. Yeah. Um, it's not a good look. Almost like they're thinking too much about <laughs> the serve versus yeah. just going for it. Yeah. You know, and, and I get it. There's, it's, it's seemingly a way to regulate how high you can hit the ball. Because, yeah, the people were bending the rules. I'd say especially Tyson at Guffin. Like, he, he was doing all this movement before the serves. So it was hard to see track where the ball is. And a lot of times, I, I actually went back and was kind of pausing some of, of the video. And he was hitting, like, chest-level serves and not getting called on it. Other people were, too, I'm sure. It's a very difficult call to make. I mean, I've watched a lot of serves. And in real time, it's, it's one of the more difficult things to be able to make a distinction between – Illegal and legal. Yeah, for sure. In any sense. For the sure. old serve versus the new serve, doesn't matter. It's still difficult. So I get it. I mean, I, I get the reason reasoning behind it, but I, it opens up a whole new kind of worms in terms of ambiguity. Again, like, can you throw it out but not up? Yeah. And, and a lot of times I, I started pausing the video also on, on this new serve, and almost everybody's throwing the ball up slightly because otherwise you can't rotate your body because as you're starting to swing, your, your left arm's obviously coming up as your right arm's going down to, to swing it. So it's not like an egregious lift, but a couple of inches, people are throwing the ball up. And it's not intentional. It's just that's how their body is, mm. is moving. So, you know, do they want to enforce that where it can't come up at all? I don't know. So this leads to, I think, the next phase, right, which is, has already been experimented with. It's already been um, in regulation for quite some time, and that is the drop serve. There's really no judgment to make. Mm-hmm. You, you drop it and hit it any way you want yeah. after that, right? There's um, really no difficulty in calling illegal versus illegal because you're just simply dropping it from whatever highest point you can achieve yeah. naturally, right? I mean, Zay Nevertill makes that point say, you know, on his podcast saying – Let's let's forego this new rule and just go to the drop serve if you actually want to regulate how high people can hit the ball. And your thoughts on that? I mean, it logically it makes sense. I don't think it it looks good for the sport to do it because everybody's going to be dropping at head level, and it's kind of like going to the local rec center and playing with seventy year olds. That's kind of how the, they all <laughs> serve. It's, it's right? not the most athletic looking stance, right? Yeah. Standing up on your tippy toes with your you know, hand high in the air, yeah. Statue of Liberty style, and <laughs> not the most athletic looking posture. Yeah. What are your thoughts on it? Would you go to a drop serve? No, I hate the drop <laughs> serve for that very reason. Yeah. Uh, I think it looks terrible. I, I think it, uh, you know, for those uninitiated looking into pickleball from the outside, they, they see that and they think, well, that kind of looks stupid. Why would I want to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's some problems with it too. I think there's um, inconsistency in the bounce. You know, we have different surfaces. We have mm-hmm. different ball-to-surface uh, contact right. um, physics. Mm-hmm. And um, it's not as standardized as one might think. Yeah, it's not. And and the whole point of it is to make the serve less of a weapon, and, and which I think is silly. Like, clearly— What's wrong with serve as a weapon? Exactly. Everything is a weapon. Right. Dinks are a weapon, too. So you want to get an advantage. And clearly, we don't want to go as far as tennis where it's— it's all serve, and the first two two hits of a point are dictate the point. It's a little bit like it's becoming like that in singles, I'd say, in in pickleball. But within reason, I think we should be able to hit very aggressive serves. You know, not overhead, but no, I don't feel like anybody was bending the rules that much before that but we needed the, to the change. The thought that. of neutralizing the serve to where it's simply a means to get the ball in play. Yeah, I'm I'm not in favor of that. No, it's silly. Um, it's a dynamic move, and it should stay that way. Yeah. Uh, one thing, though, Deckel's serve has never looked better, which is crazy because he had an amazing weapon of a serve before, and he always got called as being one of those people that been, been in, bent the rules. And I, I also went back to his video and looked, and rarely, if ever, was he actually, you know, violating the rules. He he was hitting – he's just so tall. He's 6'3", right? 6'3", 6'4". 
and he just figured out exactly the mechanics that his body could do and he's he's hitting chest level for other people but on him you know it's his hip and he's it's underhanded and coming up on the ball but his the new way he's serving it with the new rule is he's having he's being forced to hit it a little lower so he's he's putting top spin on it whereas before it was all just coming down on it with a flat hit right mm. and he was able to get it in bounds because he was hitting it like four or five feet up that's where his hips are and it's coming down at an angle enough <clears throat> but his new serve has all this shape and it's, it's a really pretty serve so I didn't get a chance to watch Tyson this last weekend mm-hmm. um, at Desert no, Deckel, Ridge Deckel is no right. Tyson okay. I mean, he's one of the ones right? Gotcha. who uh, I think is pointed at as having one mm-hmm. of those serves that's eh, yeah. a little bit questionable but how was how was his performance service wise you know it didn't last week it didn't look much different clearly okay. clearly he's hitting it lower but he adapted to it really well also he still does that kind of wind up and he's got the got the routine going before but his serves look look good too that they, they have a nice dip on them and you know i'd say that for some pros that the new serve rule doesn't change how aggressive their serves are deckel in particular like his serve is a beast still so, i've never had a problem with it yeah with Returning serve. it yeah <laughs> have you have you been oh, yeah. up against Deckel? Yeah, he's you know it's, he and I go way back. You know, you know what's funny that when I first started playing pickleball, I went out to Autry, that's here in Colorado, in Superior, Colorado, and I just went by myself to. I think I, I don't know if I had a ball machine yet, but I saw Deckel Bar, Adam Stone, um, who's Adam's wife. I forget her name. Sorry, but uh, she was there before they were married, really? and Vivian David was the fourth. And I, I recognized all of them because I've watched a few tournaments, and I was like, wow, what are these pros doing out? And it ended up that the PPA was in Denver, and they must have been staying in Superior and, and knew about the courts and went out to practice that day. That's cool. Let's move on to the next topic. So, yeah, before we move on to the next topic, I wanted to highlight one point I saw, which was one of the most amazing points in doubles that I think I've, I've ever seen. And if you go back, it's on YouTube now. Uh, if you go back to the Bar McGuffin versus the Johns Brothers match in the finals for the gold medal, watch the point in, it was Ben and CJ were up in the third game, up 9-7. So go to that point and watch it. It was the most amazing back and forth. You know Ben, when he really gets a ball that's about face level and winds up, he can hit it harder than any pro or as hard as any other pro he got three of those and hit it where he couldn't even see the ball tyson mcguffin dug out all three of those he also hit his wicked angles like they're digging out balls 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 he hit these two wicked angles and deckel got both of those deckel started running before he even hit the ball because he knew where it was going and like almost ended up in the stands there had to be at least 50 back and forths in that in that point, and eventually Ben Johns dumped it into the net. It was the most incredible, like something you never see anyway. Ben Johns screwing I up the last, that. the last point. It. Oh my God, it was it was that amazing. was in the finals. Yeah, it was in, but they ended up the Johns Bros, of course, ended up winning in three. It's a crazy match because you watch it, and most of the time you feel like Deckel and Tyson are winning it because they're they're hitting you know hitting the amazing blocks and, and the right. amazing putaways, but it's just. It's the grind that the mm-hmm. Johns brothers put on people, and they make fewer l- unforced errors, right? right? So they right. made fewer unforced errors, and they ended up being ahead on points. And it, was, it wasn't even close. It was like 11-3, 11-3, 11-6 or 8 or something in the end. And you watch it, and it seems like they're losing. It's crazy. What about the team of Guh and Black? Did you happen to watch any of those matches? I did. I was so impressed with Guh. What do you think? Oh, my goodness. If, if these two aren't the team to watch here in the next couple of weeks coming up, I mean, the the talent there, <laughs> and just the fact that he in particular, Augie, Augie Gu, yeah, uh, an unknown came out of nowhere. I had not heard of him the week before, mm-hmm. but um, such a dynamic player, such power and spin on the ball, just amazing. I think <clears throat> if the consistency were there, missed some thirds, missed some. I, I think <clears throat> for a pro, easy resets yeah. for both he and Black. Um, but if they can sort of. Dial that in. They're going to be in good shape. And where did he come from? I'd never seen him before this tournament. A local Arizona guy to the tournament. He had a big contingency out there rooting him on, and that may be uh, part of the, the winning factor there, but um, I expect to see him quite a bit more. 
Yeah, we don't have to cover the tournament in great detail, but there were a lot of close calls where Ben and Anna Lee almost lost, and and you know Ben didn't. He lost against Yao Mei in singles, and and there were so many. It's getting a lot closer. I feel like, and I feel like twenty twenty four we're gonna see new upright upstarts, and and you know people. It's not always gonna be the same outcomes as we saw in, in twenty twenty three. Yep. Plus, he's a Vatic pro player. So I think Guy he is, is yeah. yes, Ga. and so I think he's there first to kind of really uh, break the barrier. There. That's true. Yeah, we're seeing Vatic Pro and Jiao Mei with six zero. You know, very cool. Yeah, I love it. All right, and oh, speaking of people and paddle brands, so Alshon made an announcement that uh, Christian Alshon that he moved to Paddle Tech from. He was playing with Diadem before, and boy, I don't know how much the paddle played into it, but. Did he turn up his game this tournament? Absolutely. Wow. He looked incredible. I mean, his movement, he may have the best movement on the tournament. I think there's big things coming from from Alshon this year. I was super impressed by his his play on the court this weekend. What paddle was he playing with, do you know? I don't know. I didn't get to watch the whole tournament, probably 25% of it. You know, I saw just a few points out of his games. What I saw, I was really impressed with his playing, but I didn't get a chance to zero in on his, his paddle. He's dating Anna Lee Waters, right? right? Uh, Maybe uh, playing with her paddle. Who, who knows? Uh, there's who there's knows? a storyline there. <laughs> oh, and we see a lot of people, a lot of pros in the tournament playing with an unmarked, well, not even an unmarked, but a new version of a Yola paddle, the Alpha. And I think it's it's a version of all the current shapes, so you can get it in the Perseus, you can get it in the Scorpius. It's not out for, for people to buy yet. Uh, but I've heard from reputable sources that it's using a floating core similar to the, the Gearbox Power Series, Pro Power Series. So instead of, you know, a consistent polypropylene core, even with edge foam, it's, it's you know, kind of the foam around the edge holding kind of a – I don't know if it's actually – the same it's probably definitely not the same as the gearbox in terms of the um, ribs of carbon fiber with foam inside because they have that patented but the concept is the same and i it sounds the same too we you see the paddles on tv and you hear them and they sound that deeper thud much quieter than polypropylene or or kevlar and see a little bit more trampoline effect yeah and the ball seems to come off much hotter on these. Still a polypropylene core, just the, the... No, it's not. I don't think so. Oh. I think it's something with foam, like some something to not just EVA or any other type of foam, but something to to hold that firm so that it still passes the deflection tests. But I don't, we don't know. We don't know exactly what it is yet. So that that's interesting to me. And, and you know, that means also that... The concern was that the Gearbox Pro paddles would eventually become illegal because they're too powerful. Let's say if Ben Johns complained about them, you know, that that might at least at the PPA level make people say they're banned at that level. But if Yola's using them, then I heard that Ben and Colin have both tested them. They've been seeing playing with them. So that means that the Gearbox Pro is here to stay for sure. Any word on production of the new Yola's? I heard something like June, maybe, is when they're coming out, but we'll see. Another element of gear news is that the that Duper, Duper tournaments now have an official ball, and that is the as-yet-unreleased Gamma Chuck ball. Chuck. The Chuck. The Chuckster. <laughs> I like it. It's very unpretentious. And we, I, so you and I just came from the courts. We tested several paddles, which we'll talk about soon, mm-hmm. but we also... Uh, brought out the Gamma Chalk Ball. What did what did you think about it? I really enjoyed it. I, I thought it was a super consistent ball. Plays a little on the harder side. Feels heavy. Mm-hmm. I didn't weigh it. Yeah. I assume you did. I did. But um, I, I felt like it was uh, super predictable. It is. It is. Let me pull up my... And at least during our playtime, did not come out of round. That's the thing. Like, it plays It plays hot. I'd say it's a it's a very lively ball. Uh, On the order of the Vulcan. Vulcan's also a pretty lively ball. And you're right, it does feel heavier, but it's not. It goes back to the fact that some balls just feel heavier than others, even though the weight is the same. It is close to the Dura and hardness. I'll pull up the spreadsheet here in a second. But I do feel like it plays definitely a little softer. And like other balls that are nudging up against 
Dura in terms of the hardness levels, like the Selkirk, like Vulcan, it does seem to play a little softer. And I think that's because it does soften up quicker than Dura does. Dura maintains its its hardness, I think, and that's probably why it cracks so much easier than than all the other balls. Anyhow, I, I liked it. We played about a dozen games today, I would say, with it, and I did not feel any change in consistency right. in terms of uh, hardness or um, firmness of the ball. Okay, so you didn't feel that? To... You felt like it, stayed, it started a little softer and it stayed that way? Yep. Okay. And the I wouldn't hardness. by any means call it a soft ball. Not at all. All right, so they, the Gamma Chuck is a... Hardness Ashore, D hardness of 59.0 versus the Onyx Dura, which is 59.3. To compare that to the new Vulcan, the new Vulcan is 59.2. So the Vulcan's a little harder than the Gamma Chuck, but I like the Gamma Chuck. I like it a lot better than, Vul- than the Vulcan, simply because it stays round. We played with, like you said, several games, and mm-hmm. it never once went out of round and can't say that for the Vulcan. We actually played with that also. Threw that in a couple of games after we played with the Chuck, and there's a noticeable difference in terms of the roundness for sure. I like giving balls names. Yeah. Chuck works for me. <laughs> Does Vulcan have I a name? It. The the Vulcan is the V-Pro Flight. Yeah. Yeah. Much less memorable <laughs> than the Chuck. How much are those Gamma Chucks? Do uh, you know? The Gamma... Oh. We don't know yet. It's coming out Friday. The good folks from from Gamma actually just sent me their new paddles too, and and a couple new couple extra balls. Uh, they sent me, I think, twelve of the balls earlier. But they mentioned that the chuck will be released on Friday. So we do not know how much it costs. Hopefully, I imagine, almost certainly, Less it's going to be Vulcan. cheaper than the Vulcan. Probably around the same price as the as the Onyx Duras. Well, it seems like Gamma has awakened. From a long slumber, John. That's a, yeah, it's a great segue. So should we jump into our... Before we do that, pick a ball slam two. Mm. Agassi, ah, yes. Graf, McEnroe, and Sharapova. ESPN on Sunday night. Mm-hmm. Man, that was fun to watch. You know, I didn't see it. I was, I was traveling back from, from Saudi, but uh, you mentioned what paddles they were playing, and I went and saw some of the highlights today. And... First thing I noticed was how much better Andre Agassi. Good lord, got. he's a pickleball player now. He, yeah, he doesn't look like a tennis player. And that two is sorts. solid. I mean, it's always been solid. He's I, just that's what he had. Yeah, he had an amazing two e in tennis, but what he's doing with that that two e in, in pickleball is I don't know if there's a better one in the pro ranks right now. Like it's probably not as consistent as most. Well, Con- Connor Garnett, I'd say, probably has a better one. It dips harder. Andre just flies super. Fast and low, <laughs> and it stays in most of the time. It was something to watch. I mean, the difference from PB Slam one uh-huh. to this match. I mean, he's he's transformed as a player, and he wasn't terrible then. Yeah, but now he's he's looking like a pickleball player. Yeah, yeah. The soft game was on point. I mean, all four were playing good good pickleball. Yeah, but he in particular. I didn't watch enough to to be able to guess what their dupers might be. But from what I saw, Andre is at least a 5-0 now. I'd say so. Yeah, which is impressive. I mean, I'm sure he hasn't been playing that consistently, although he's not like McEnroe and he's not bashing pickleball. Did we just lose the, lose the camera? That sucked last time that we lost that one. Uh, that was when your, oh, when that your one camera went out, went out okay. of focus, so I couldn't use the, the third camera. So <laughs> we need this little camera over here. Um, yeah, for McEnroe... To get a big payday off pickleball when he has been so outspoken about how pickleball is mm-hmm. forever going to be the the little brother of tennis. That that just bothers me. Yeah. I mean, that's a shtick, right? But it, it is kind of a crappy way to have your cake, cake and eat it too, you know? So I'm happy to see Agassi and Graf take that one away this week. Yeah. It was a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. I'm looking forward to the next one. Yeah. And Steffi Graf and Andre Agassi were playing with the... Komodo katana, right? Which is a another Kevlar paddle. Shoot, we didn't we didn't bust that out today. I had it in a bag and we didn't play with it. That'll today. be our paddle of the week next week. Yeah, so push that to next week. But but yeah, uh, they they did send me one. I me- I kept meaning to reach out to Komodo uh, because they're one of the few people to have Kevlar on the face of a paddle. Mm-hmm. 
earlier last year before everybody started doing it. And they're a Colorado company. They're based in Grand Junction. So a local Colorado company. And they did reach out to me last week. And I have not hit with it yet. I, I, I started running metrics on it. Uh, one thing I'll note is, man, their packaging is amazing. It comes, I don't know if it's a special edition, but it came in this elaborate box uh, you know, with you know with the Japanese theme it had like this nice little handle to, to lift the box you know like a cloth handle that you put the box up the box is probably five times heavier and more stout than than any other pickleball box that I've that I've seen so I can't speak to the how great how good the paddle plays I don't know I did feel like a gen one paddle I haven't looked too much into it but I could feel the the core exposed in the handle which Maybe it's not the greatest. I don't know. But uh, we'll hit with it and yep. see how it plays. Sounds good. All right. So let's talk about the paddles that we did play with today. So uh, as we mentioned, let's, let's, let's go ahead and continue with Gamma since Gamma, Gamma sent me their new paddle line. So we've got four new paddles from Gamma. Uh, let's start with the Obsidian first. So the new Obsidians come in three thicknesses. We played with each of them. They have a 16, a 13, and a 10. I thought I was calling it 11 earlier. It's actually 10. I'm reading it right that here. 10 is a knife. A <laughs> knife, a knife. I mean, look at the thinness on this paddle. Uh, that's Eddie's. That's crazy. Yeah. So 10 is the same thickness. I think the uh, Prokinex Black Ace, it's, is it 11? It's advertised at 11, I think. Maybe it's, it's, it's right close. around there. Yep. I measured it before, and I think it's a little... Uh, thinner than it's advertised, but regardless, this is probably the thinnest paddle you can buy today. And then, again, 16 and 13. So, Eddie, what are your thoughts on each of these paddles? Out of the three, I I really enjoyed the 16, but I'm, I'm more of a 16 guy anyway. Um, but the control on that 16 and just the ability to shape ball, for me, that was my favorite of those three paddles. Um, a solid hitter. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, Gamma's come a long way. And they're good-looking paddles, too. That white edge on a black face, to me, is really smart-looking. Yeah. So I was most intrigued with the with the 11 millimeter, just because it when you first hit with it, it plays a lot softer than the Pro Kinex Black Ace, for example, and other super Absolutely. thin paddles. And that I like. You know, that that's one of the issues with super thin paddles. Paddles, they get great pop, but they also feel like you're hitting a board piece of plywood. And this this no. doesn't feel that Mm-mm. like that. Mm-mm. After playing with it, the sweet spot is a little smaller than the others. And there's less power, as expected with a thinner paddle, but more pop. So you know what I mean? With the baseline drives and serves, you get you get less plow through, less power. But at the kitchen, there is more pop. It does I haven't run the the metrics on it yet. I don't know what the swing weight is, but all of these felt like not the lightest swing weight. Well, I would say if I had to make a guess, uh-huh. I would put them in the 123 to 125 range. Definitely for the 16, 13. They felt a little, definitely some head yeah. heavy. But the 11, you'd think it would be around 100. I'd say it's probably between 110 and 120. You know, could be. Guessing. Yep. But Absolutely. 16 above 120 for sure. I didn't feel like there was a lot of power to be gained versus the 16. There was definitely more power, but not so significant that you, you're willing to give up that control. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, my favorite ended up being the 13. And okay. I, I usually like 16s. Just that's my favorite paddle thickness. But like I said, the, the 11 the sweet spot was a little narrower. I didn't try to shore that up with lead tape. Mm-hmm. That, that could be a possi- definitely a possibility probably plays a lot better with lead tape the 13 out of the box though i was very impressed with it doesn't feel like a 13 or even a 14 millimeter in my opinion it feels more plush than that uh and it it definitely had better hand speed and maneuverability than the 16 and again i haven't done the swing weights but i'm guessing it's maybe around 118 it feels a little heavier i'd say than the six zero double black diamond which is you know 114 115 and it's kind of that good balance between power and pop for me also. It it uh, struck that balance for me between power and pop and 
Yeah, it spins good on all these. They're all using the raw carbon fiber. You're getting some amazing dip on your drives with these. Your drives today were on point. They were <laughs> feeling good today, feeling strong. <laughs> yeah, so that's the... I didn't get a good feel for pop on any of them. We weren't really playing that type of game today, mm -hmm. uh, being skinny singles. Yeah. Would like to get that out on a, on a doubles court and see how it goes. Because yeah. I feel like that's where pop really shows up. That's true. We, we got in a few dink exchanges, but it, it always ended... You know, five points in, five hits in. Yep. But <laughs> the crown jewel, I'd say, of Man, their new lineup, is... I was really impressed. With, this is the Airbender, and this is, the, you know, they're, they're new. They've had the Obsidians for a while. They, they, they've they updated these clearly they, with the thicknesses. I don't know what else they did with them, but the Airbender is entirely new. There's and, a ton of technology there. Uh, you know, again, we've only played with it for a day now, and both of us probably put in four games each with it, maybe. Uh, but... So far, uh, duly impressed. So, um, yeah, it's got the got the hole here. Uh, one of the things I like about it, or one of the new technologies, is it's got this removable rubber piece and a hole here. And they they come with. I don't have them here in the studio, but they come with different weights on these. So this is what comes stock, and it's very light. But you can put in up to, I think it's half an ounce is the heaviest one so you can add weight to the neck of the paddle and it uh, there's vibration damping with this rubber piece and i played with it in and played with it out and i did feel a difference it Same. wasn't yeah it wasn't a huge difference but it definitely reduces the vibration of the hits which i love i think that's fantastic it gives the impression of a larger sweet spot than maybe it actually has because those off-center hits, they, they can be jarring sometimes. And that, I don't know what that's made of, mm -hmm. but it does seem to absorb some of that vibration, giving the sort of the impression of a large sweet spot. And it does have a good sweet spot, but yeah. um, maybe even feels even bigger than it is. So the, the, the looks are great on it. Uh, it's edgeless, but it has kind of this um, textured edge to it. It's not an edge guard, but uh, it, it looks solid, very s smooth looking paddle. It seems pretty durable, that edge guard. I mean, I'm not yeah. gentle with paddles by any means, and that seems to hold up fairly well. It's, yeah. It seems a bit more um, durable than what we've seen yeah. lately in edgeless paddles. It's a little bit embossed, so there might be an issue with keeping lead tape on. I haven't thought about that. Shouldn't be too much of an issue, though. Uh, we'll talk about Braden's um, tungsten tape in a second, but I think that would stick on here just fine. But yeah, I mean, you know, I don't want to talk it up too much because I haven't played with it enough to, to really know. Uh, but so far, so good. I'd say I'm, I'm pretty happy that Gamma has, has released a, a, a good new paddle. Oh, one other thing. Uh, the cap on the base of the handle comes off and you can add weight there too, which is – so you can add weight to the neck. You can add weight to the handle. You know, I think this is – this is a new trend that we're seeing with paddles. I think we will be seeing quite a bit of that going forward. Yeah, for sure. Any other thoughts on, on the Airbender? Well, as a, a guy with two kids who grew up on the show Avatar, I kind of love the name. I, I was about to say I like <laughs> the that name, too. Even, yeah, even though I, I didn't know the reference to, to Avatar. But I do, I do like the name Airbender. I think it's a really cool paddle name. But speaking of the caps and the base of the handle, I wanted to... Talk about grip, grip paddles. Uh, that's the the brand name. Uh, the paddle is Balance One. I've had this paddle now for for months, and I, I've I've been meaning to do a review on it. I will eventually, but they were the first that I know of to use this cap technology. And again, they have a little tool you can take out the cap in the base and replace it with ones with more weight. And the the Gamma paddle, I think the the heaviest. The heaviest cap is 15 grams, and there's the grips goes up to 30 grams. And it does make a difference. I actually ran some metrics on it in terms of power and pop, and I want to refine those. <laughs> this camera's giving us so much grief. I want to refine those a little bit before I say too much about it. But what I did notice is since you're, since you're putting weight at the base of the handle, it doesn't change the swing weight at all. It doesn't make it lighter. You can't erase the swing weight, but you can add weight and keep your swing weight completely stable. And it reduces the balance point significantly, as you, as you would imagine. So, <clears throat> again, balance point is where you can actually balance it on your finger. So this one is here. 
with the butt cap, you can change that balance point, which which makes it actually feel lighter in your hands, or at least whippier. You're able to get more. I find that it. it also increases the at least the feeling of stability mm-hmm. as well. But one of the things I noticed with the metrics is that the extra weight at the very end of the handle gave it a boost in power, just as lead tape does anywhere else on a paddle. But when you do that anywhere else on the paddle, when you add lead tape other places on the paddle, it, it gives a, an equal or close to equal decrease in pop. That's a trend that I've noticed. I think Braden from Pickleball Effect has also noticed it. So it's a trade-off when you throw lead or weight anywhere around the perimeter of the paddle. When you add it to the base, as far as my initial testing suggests or indicates, it actually increases both the power and the pop. And I think what's going on is that with the lower balance point, it makes it more maneuverable because, you're, like I said, you're able to whip through a little easier because you're not struggling with more weight above your hand. The weight below your hand is, is making it, making the balance point lower and making it easier to speed up more quickly. Again, initial testing, but it seems that it increases both power and pop. It makes sense, and I think that's, again, technology we'll be seeing more of. I've been playing around with this idea myself as I have added, over time, a lot of weight to the the head of the gearbox pro power that I've been using to kind of open up that sweet spot. Mm -hmm. Um, I've also taken away maneuverability, and I've taken away, as you said, I think some pop. So what I've been doing is removing some of that weight from the head and wrapping several inches of lead tape around the base of the grip. So my own homemade version of this this new grip technology that we're seeing. And it seems to be very effective. So that's right. You you drilled and put some tungsten in your paddle. Uh, in one just for fun, but mm-hmm. I have another one where I, I wrap the base of the, the grip at, before re-gripping it. Okay. Yeah. Same effect. It, there's Yeah. I'd, I'd say there's definitely some performance perks with adding weight below your hand. You know, people have been doing it in paddle handles for a while now. Uh, it's still quite un- – not quite clear exactly what it does, but yeah, like I said, it seems to be kind of a workaround with with the trade offs that adding lead tape above your hand present. So it's kind of interesting. It's been happening in tennis for a long time, mm-hmm. um, either with tungsten putty or um, other weights in the the base of the handle. Mm-hmm. Um, for these very reasons, big shout out to to Grip. They make a really good paddle. What do you? I feel like this plays really well too. It's very familiar. It's a thermoformed paddle. At, I can't recall what the thickness is. It looks to be about 14 millimeters thick. Mm-hmm. Raw carbon fiber. If you come from any any a Gen 2 thermoform paddle with a long handle, this is going to feel very familiar to you. I think it plays well. I'd say that the the sweet spot was, wasn't was as large as, let's say, the 6-0 double black diamond. That's become our gold standard, right, for, for a good sweet spot. Uh, and it's probably because the paddle's elongated and a little more narrow, less twist weight. But I, sh- I did throw on some lead tape, three grams on each side at the 4 o'clock and 8 o'clock positions. And that, I feel like, really broadened the sweet spot and made it play a lot better. What are your thoughts, Eddie? Uh, I would say that that word familiar is probably um, an apt Mm-hmm. Adjective because it uh, it does feel a lot like a, the the Gen twos that are out there in a slightly different form factor. So if right. if you're leaning towards more of that slightly elongated without going full bore elongated, I think that's probably um, maybe one you should look at. You hit some absolute missiles with that paddle though. After adding that lead tape, so I'm not sure if it's uh, contributing to that, but. Mm-hmm. Man, I was in fear for my life. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly because I was out of control. <laughs> okay, let's jump to the Groovin. I've got to give s- some props to, to Groovin. They've been sending me most of their paddle line. Kevin uh, at Groovin, the owner, uh, fantastic gentleman, uh, really passionate about paddles. And Groovin is, was the third paddle company ever to use raw carbon fiber. They're, they're OGs in the raw carbon fiber market. Such a fun paddle, mm-hmm. I gotta say. This one, this is a 16S, the 13S as well. Super maneuverable. Well, this shape in particular, you know, it's a wide body and um, it's it has a great sweet spot, but it also has the longer handle, five and a half inch handle at least. And um, 
given that it's shorter, it, it just has a, a lower swing weight. So it does feel very light in the hands. The 16 millimeter has obviously a, a larger sweet spot at larger swing weight than the 13 mil, but it's still a very maneuverable. Absolutely. I think paddle. if you come from a table tennis background in particular, and you're used to using that wristy motion, um, this paddle, I think, not just in terms of swing bait, but look at the shape of it. I mean, if that's not a giant ping pong paddle, I don't know what is. Yeah, it does. I mean, it's a cutesy looking paddle. It looks like a lollipop, uh, but it does not play like a lollipop. It actually hits pretty dang hard for for such a I was actually body surprised paddle. being as light as it is. It's um, it does pack a wallop and good spin. Obviously, rock iron fiber. I can't remember if this uses the fine or the coarse grit, but regardless, really good paddle. If anybody enjoys playing with a wide body paddle with an elongated handle, uh, this is a great choice. Similar to the uh, Volaire Mach Two Forza, and it's thermoformed again, so it has the edge foam and it hits harder than Gen One paddles. Okay, Pro Drive. The Pro Drive. At the end of the day, Eddie, Eddie and I were like, "All right, let's play with our favorite paddles." I chose the Pro Drive, and you picked up the Airbender. And then at the end of that game, we were both like, "Man, both of these paddles are are really great." So, Pro Drive came out with a new edgeless paddle, and Ooh, uh, that yeah, thing looks good. It looks really great. Yeah. A lot of people struggle with the actual edge when you when you have an edge, edgeless paddle. It looks a little rough, and some people solve that with like. The way Six Zero made their Infinity series with with kind of a thick paint that they put over it, but man, this thing is just sharp all the way around. It being edgeless, it's <clears throat> more maneuverable than their other tank of a paddle that they released. Uh, it's 16 millimeters thick. It's raw carbon fiber, and the core is actually composed of three layers. You know, similar to what Diadem has done, uh, where they do a two thinner polypropylene layers on the outside adjacent to the face and then the interior core is in the middle the sandwich core is a uh, kevlar aramid and the reason for that is control and power both so if you're hitting with a softer swing softer stroke as in a dink that polypropylene is going to be the primary contributor to mm -hmm. how the ball flies right whereas if you're swinging harder you're going to get to that middle part of the core, mm -hmm. Kevlar, and that's going to give you the power. That's the theory, and I think it's it's mostly accurate. I would you know, agree. I, I would say that it doesn't feel as soft as a full polypropylene core, even with dinking, but I was impressed because it feels softer than the Diadem Warrior, for example, which is a big fat boy at 19 millimeters thick, but it's still, it still it also has that sandwiched air med in the center and, and polypropylene on the outside, but that one... I'd say it feels stiffer even when dinking. Uh, and the sweet spot on that is much smaller than this one. So they, they've struck a good balance here that somehow they come up with a formula using Aramid and cores, which I've never really enjoyed playing with up to now. I understand the benefits. It does create a poppier paddle and more power. But the, the trade-off for me in terms of the, the feel, the vibration, mm -hmm. the stiffness, it, it was never enough for me to, to migrate toward Aramid cores, but this one plays really well. For an edgeless paddle, the swing weight, I'd say, again, I haven't measured it yet, but it, it's probably close to 120, if not above. So it's not as... It feels up there. Yeah. It's not as lightweight as other edgeless paddles, but the trade-off with the added, added swing weight is power. This thing packs a lot of power based on my testing, and what we did today was kind of a, I think we call it the the Clash of the Titans. So if we wanted to compare the most powerful paddles, the top three in my database, which happen to be, uh, everybody knows by now, I think that, that have watched my videos, that the Gearbox Pro Series, the, the power version of that, takes the number one spot. It's just under the EVA foam paddles in terms of the velocity of, of balls with full swings. And I mentioned in, in the last podcast, or in podcast number one, that... Others are creeping up on it, and we got some people in the comments like, what are the other paddles that, that are creeping up on it? So the Pro Drive was one, and the uh, Sword and Shield uh, J1H uh, was the other. So these two are, are coming up close to, but not quite as powerful as the uh, Gearbox Pro Power. Did you happen to make note of the 
sound of the Pro Drive. Okay, so the Pro Drive, the sound does not, it's not as pingy as full Kevlar or Aramid cores. To um, me, it sounds different than just about every paddle out there. Does it? What do, what do you hear in it? Uh, it sounds very dynamic, very uh, explosive. Not in a high-pitched way, mm -hmm. but in a uh, almost a cracking noise. Okay. So when you hit it hard? Yeah. Okay. Sounds great. Yeah, now I'm remembering the sound of it more. You jog my memory there. I think, yeah, it's a, there's a, a powerful sound when you hit it hard. Oh, yeah. Anyway, what, what are your thoughts on... And this so I, I really power. enjoyed the Pro Drive. Uh, I thought it was very consistent, easy to to extract that power. Whereas with the Sword and Shield, the power was there, but for me, I could not get to a point of consistency where I could tap into that power mm -hmm. uh, as frequently as I would with right. the Gearbox or even the Pro Drive. Right. Uh, I would say in you know one game of skinny singles with you, I I maybe hit one or two shots with the sword and shield that I felt like were powerful, mm -hmm. that were exactly what I was intending to do with a particular drive, whereas with the pro drive, those numbers were much higher. Yeah, you were struggling with the sword and shield. And to be fair, you know, you only played one game with it. Uh, and by the end of it, you were much improved from the beginning. I didn't have as hard of a time adjusting to it. It does hit hard, really hard. I'd say not as hard as the... Gearbox Pro Power, and definitely not as much pop. The, the swing weight on this one is really high. I think it's close to 130. Uh, so It's a sword. <laughs> it's a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, I think um, uh, the power is there with full swings. The pop, not as much as the Gearbox Pro Power. But I, I enjoyed it. And one thing I noticed is, my God, the, the spin on this is nuts. And I don't know if it's entirely from the raw carbon fiber texture, or if it's a combination of that and, and more dwell time. One thing I did notice about this paddle is that it flexes a lot when you hit it, which maybe is what was throwing you off. I didn't mind as much. It feels So what I mean by that is when you take a full swing and you hit it, you can feel the paddle flex at the neck. There's a massive flex point at the neck. I think that adds to the power by causing the, the, the ball both to dwell more on it and then also giving that that rebound that effect you get. But I did hit some really nice dipping shots. Might have even landed in the kitchen from my baseline. Oh, my God. <laughs> you were doing that with almost every paddle, though, today. So you were passing me in skinny singles. I was just like, how is Eddie doing this? <laughs> like Clean winners, at least like <laughs> six of them. It was nuts. Um, but, yeah, this, this thing, when you do a full swing with it, can impart a lot of power. Um, so I'd say in terms of, you know, the absolute winner – for power, I think that still goes to the Gearbox Pro Power for sure. Um, of these two, I'd say that for me, the the J1H by Sword and Shield gave more power. This Pro Drive Encounter definitely was more well balanced, though. It had the power when I needed it. It had the touch when I needed it, and the pop was, I'd say, pretty good with this. I need to to test the pop. It's not going to be as poppy as other lightweight paddles because it is a heavier swing weight, but I think the materials make up for that in terms of that air med core providing more velocity with, with shorter swings. And just to be clear, that purple is your edge tape, right? It's funny. This is my edge tape. It's not doesn't come stock. It's actually uh, Braden from Pickleball okay. Effect sent me this, but it looks— So it stock looks, is straight black, stealth straight black. Straight black, stealth black. Yeah. This looks dark gray to me. The purple. So <laughs> it's funny. A couple of people have mentioned, like, yeah, that's, that's nope. a colorful, that's purple. colorful paddle. Yeah. So. <laughs> that's a pretty slick-looking paddle. Yeah. So back to, our, back to our favorite two. So we like the Airbender and we like the Pro Drive uh, the best out of the paddles that we hit with today. Those would be my two choices. Yeah. I, I'd say that right now my, my favorite is going to be go to, go to the Pro Drive. The Airbender... Is, is awesome, but I, I felt the Pro Drive just felt a little more natural. I think something about the, the launch angle trajectory was a little more similar to my um, Ruby with the Pro Drive. But to be fair, this is after maybe six games right. with each paddle. Yep. So I don't, you know, I can't declare that this is, is much better than that. Now, if Gamma with that Airbender, mm -hmm. if it were in the shape of their other line of paddles, now that to me would be really interesting. I, I'm not a huge fan of the, the, square 
of the Airbender. I love the edge guard. I mm-hmm. think that's cool. Mm-hmm. Um, the throat is oh, really you mean, neat. You, you mean the obsidian? You're right. not a fan of the obsidian shape. No, I am a fan of the obsidian. Oh, okay, yeah. but you wish they had that in the that shape, but with the airbender. the airbender. Okay, interesting tech. That's true. So the the obsidian, I feel like, flares out a little bit, similar to the six zero design, where it flares out a little bit toward the head of the paddle. Yeah, it's cool looking. I, mean, I think it also provides some performance perks too, in the sense that it broadens the sweet spot by right. making the twist weight larger. So I didn't feel that the that the Airbender lacked in sweet spot. I mean, like any edgeless paddle, it's not going to have as large of a sweet spot as as paddles with edge guards. But there's enough weight in the perimeter. I don't I don't know exactly what the technology is, but I imagine they have edge foam in there, perimeter foam, and whatever they did with the edges added some weight to it. It's, it's not just a, a flimsy thin edge. There's there's something going on on the edges to, Agree. to add some weight. So great paddles. Yep. I, I enjoyed playing with, with all these today. And I'm pretty happy that Gamma's making some some waves with new paddles and good new paddles too. What's next, John? Okay. I wanted to make a section for the podcast where we do kind of a deep dive in kind of testing. or just a deep dive in and what I'm doing currently, what we're doing currently to kind of test paddles. So I'm always kind of thinking of, of new ways to come up with metrics that – would measure performance on a paddle. And as we mentioned before, with the airbender, with, with that rubbery insert in the neck, it reduces the vibration and it makes the paddle feel better in terms of the sweet spot. Maybe the sweet spot's not actually getting wider in terms of the rebound of the ball around the perimeter, but it feels better when you're hitting it because there's less vibration going in your, into your hand. I thought about that a while back when I was measuring surface hardness. I thought I would kind of get a sense of, of a paddle's plushness versus hardness by measuring it with the durometer. And like I mentioned in the first podcast, it doesn't really work that way. And I think the reason is that plushness plays into the vibrations going into your hand from the paddle. So I started brainstorming about ideas on how to actually quantify plushness, surface hardness, and hopefully even sweet spot. Uh, I don't know how far this is going to take me, but I got a, this is an accelerometer, which measures vibration frequency. And also it measures the the pitch of this device, you know, this way and this way. So it's kind of a three-dimensional, both vibrometer and, you know, the, the angle that the pitch go, is going back and forth. And then this is an impact hammer. These are not common. I actually ordered this from a factory in China. And you pull this plunger back and you strike it against something. And it delivers exactly one joule of force uh, when you strike it. So this is a standardized way. And and my thought was I'd put the accelerometer on the handle where your hand goes Mm. and then mark the paddle uh, spots every inch or so, uh, you know, on the x-axis and y-axis and then measure the vibration frequency with the accelerometer as well as if you clamped it down with something simulating a human hand and created the same grip strength on each of them, then the the amount that the paddle bends on the y-axis and also twists when you're off, off axis would tell you a lot. So the biggest difficulty I'm having right now is actually finding something to, to consistently grip the, the handle. It sounds easier than it is. I've, I've had some issues. So if anybody knows of a device that it would actually – create like a vice and squeeze the, the paddle grip similar to a human hand and not just in one spot, but, you know, about the width of a human hand. Hit me up in the comment section, please, because I'm having issues with that. But but that's the goal is to eventually quantify uh, the vibration of the paddle and see if that actually relates to our feeling of the paddle in terms of plushness versus hardness and also potentially the sweet spot. Sweet spot. That would be huge. Yeah. You want to feel the? Yeah, give it to me. That's that's not <laughs> insignificant. It's not. You know, I, <laughs> it's one, more than I thought it was going to be. One yeah. joule of energy. I, I did the calculation, and and it was the equivalent, basically, of equivalent of a pickleball traveling at twenty something miles an hour and hitting the paddle. But as you can see, I think it's more than that. So if I'm just holding the paddle with a loose grip, I'd say three out of ten. I hit the the paddle. I don't feel like your paddle is going to move that much with a. 20 mile per hour pickleball. 
I could be wrong. And that really sort of exemplifies what an off-center hit impact would be. Mm, and right. we don't necessarily have that feeling with a pickleball, but for something like that, it's really going to be obvious. Yeah. One inch off center, two inches off center. Oh, God. Okay. It's, it's, that's going to be really interesting data. Okay. Let's move on to gear of the week, things that we're kind of enjoying at the moment. doesn't have to be paddles, but it's funny. I am very particular about glasses that I wear. I used to have this shirt in high school that said, function before fashion. And that was kind of my motto. I'm like, if something works, then what does it matter if it looks like? And I'm gone away from that a little bit. No, you, you know, haven't. In, <laughs> <laughs> but I'd say for, for glasses, like I'm very particular about the glasses I put on my face. My, my eyeglasses that I wear are like Italian designer glasses. Not, not, nothing, you know, too outrageous, but I just, I like the company, all of, all of our people. Uh, they just make quality glasses and they make the designs that I like. But I've had a really hard time finding safety glasses for pickleball. You know, I went through most of the major brands and they just didn't feel right or it didn't look, look right on my face. But I landed on Rhea eyewear. Seeing ads about this. I have too. That's actually what turned me on to them. They're not cheap. I, I spent over $200 for these glasses and, and the extra lenses, but I'm really happy with uh, these in particular. So they make pickleball-specific um, protective glasses. The lint, again, Italian-made, <laughs> Italian design and manufactured. Uh, the lenses come in different shades. I got the I played with the clear ones today. They have an indoor kind of orange tinted lens that I've tried. I still have them. I found that in dimmer lighting, I have a harder time seeing with them. Uh, so like at the Lifetime Westminster location we play with, mm -hmm. it's at a basketball court with kind of the harsh lighting. And I have a hard time seeing with the orange tinted lenses. These clear ones did a lot better for me. Uh, the lenses do not fog up. I feel very secure with do these. Do you wear a prescription, John? I do, but, but I don't need them for a distance. It's just you don't. Okay, just reading glasses, basically. So yeah, I mean, I'm not connected with Rhea. I don't have an affiliate code or anything, but I think they make fantastic glasses if you're willing to spend a lot of money on protective glasses. Well, for me, outside of the paddle, if you're going to spend money somewhere, it's keeping your eyes safe and your shoes. I mean, seeing the ball and getting to the ball, to me, are the probably the two most important things about pickleball. So I don't have a problem spending money on, on good eyewear. Mm -hmm. I probably have 20 pairs of glasses, and I, I do wear prescription glasses. Uh, for me, I've been wearing these for about a year. These are Oakley's. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the FLAC 2.0. Mm -hmm. What I like about these and what uh, is in common with your eyeglasses is that it's three points of contact that are all rubberized. So the nose and, and your two temples all rubberized. Mm -hmm. so if you don't have that, these things are flying off, right? Right. Especially when you're sweaty. Uh, and these, the sweatier you get, the I think the stickier they are. Yeah. These are prescription, and they're prescription from, and from side to side, up and down. Oh, really? So okay. throughout my entire field of vision, I'm seeing clearly. That's... That's Which pretty amazing. Is great. A lot of sports sunglasses, especially these types of wraps, come with uh, an insert for a prescription. They make the glasses heavy, sort of front heavy, because uh -huh. it's it's a you know a thing you stick inside, right? A, a subframe almost, uh, and then you're only getting clear vision throughout a small fraction of the whole wrap. Right. These are side to side, and these are actually customized from a company called Sport RX. Uh, I think they're in California, but mm -hmm. they work with a lot of brands like Oakley um, to provide their own lenses, Right, um, which is cool. These are great. I love them for indoor. I have to think about what to do for outdoor, but um, I love the wraps. These are great because for me, I don't want my glasses to be visible. Mm -hmm. And when I have these on, I don't really see the frame. That's the thing. It was really hard for me to find glasses that I could play pickleball in. I. I struggled even with sunglasses outside. It took me, me a long time to find a balance where I, I played well with sunglasses. But indoors was particularly bad. I, yeah. I could not find glasses that didn't throw off my equilibrium indoors. Oh, and like I said, I'm kind of a snob when it comes to the looks of glasses. Those look those look fine. I went through some Oakleys that didn't fit my face well, uh, and I've seen some the kind of obnoxious looking ones that other you know other people wear but those you know, those are subtle and and look look fine yeah the the, the new carbon glasses <laughs> <laughs> i 
<laughs> I can't get behind. <laughs> like, I, mean, I mean, they're going to protect your eyes. Yeah, so and I, as far I, as function goes, that's where yeah, that's where my function before fashion doesn't doesn't work because I understand the concept having these wide kind of yeah. ski goggle glasses to not obscure your vision. You're not going to see the frames on those suckers when you wear them. I, for some, they might be perfect. For yeah. a face like mine, they're going to touch my face in certain places, mm. like here on my cheeks okay. or here on my temples. Yeah. Uh, and I can't stand that. I don't want to feel my, my glasses yeah. in any way. That's one sort of issue with, with these Rias is there's a pretty thick nose guard, and that's, that's for protection. You know, if, if you do get hit, hit hard in the face, your the bridge of your nose is going to take the brunt of the force, you know, and, yep. and, and it's going to cause the glasses not to break too. But you do feel that when you're wearing them, you know, and you kind you see a little bit of that nose nose guard when you're looking straight, kind of. But it didn't take me long to get used to these, and and in all honesty, these perform better than any other protective glasses that I've worn. I've heard a lot about them. People have great things to say about Ria. Yeah. Would uh, ultimately, I'll try on a pair, see how they fit. Yeah. I've been hit in the eye before. I mean, before, when I first started pickleball, I refused to wear glasses. I mm-hmm. thought people looked silly. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was like not the cool thing to do. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm pretty aware of balls coming at me from the other team. Mm-hmm. What happened was a ball ricocheted off my partner's paddle, mm-hmm. kind of hit the edge guard right into my eye, and I was, I was out. I had to go to the you know the emergency eye doctor and um, have all that taken care of. Scratched cornea was the end result, but it, it could have easily been a, a lost eye. It's scary stuff. Uh, you, you it's don't not worth it. If it's you know two hundred dollar pair of glasses, that's a really good insurance policy. You know we're on power paddles today, kind of compared to yeah. the most powerful paddles. And as paddles are getting more powerful, it's it's necessary. Oh, I watched I watched uh, Braden's new podcast with uh, Porter Barr and there was a scene in there he had a video of him getting hit right in the eye yeah. and it's it was scary you know it, it, I think uh, his opponent was using a gearbox and that little bit of difference in power that the high tier power paddles provide it, it doesn't look that big on a graph you know it's only a couple of miles per hour but at 14 feet away it sneaks up on you a lot faster and you like the human reaction time just isn't quick enough. It's hugely important. And shout out to 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 Braden's new podcast. I really enjoy Porter yep. Bar. He's a he's a great. And I forgot to mention also. Thank you, Braden, for sending me uh, some of your gear. Your edge tape is is. I've always been a fan. I've mentioned that in my videos. But your um your tungsten tape is also uh, fantastic. I've got. Oh, I don't have it with me, but I, I've put it on my Gearbox Pro Power together with your your edge tape, and it looks. So much sleeker than lead, and I'm so much happier to use tungsten rather than lead for fear for fear of the lead, you know, rubbing off Toxicity and poisoning me, <laughs> causing brain damage. Oh, one more thing about uh, eyeglasses, and and that is, it it's not a matter of if it, it's a matter of when. It's going to happen to you at some point if mm-hmm. you play pickleball and if you play pickleball at any level. It's not just the beginners that are getting hit. It's as you said, the game's getting faster, and our ability to to outrun the ball is getting less and less, right? So yeah. uh, highly encourage, and I'm happy to see eyeglass manufacturers kind of piggybacking on this pickleball trend. You, mm-hmm. When you go to uh, Rudy Project, um, they're an athletic sports wear provider. They have a whole pickleball section. When you go to Sport RX, mm-hmm. they have frames and, and lenses specifically tuned to pickleball. So yeah. I'm happy to see a lot of manufacturers picking up on this. It's really cool. Yeah, I think it's totally necessary in pickleball, and it is good to see manufacturers. You know, they're, they're driven by financial reasons, but but it's it's good to to have options within pickleball, for specifically for pickleball related uh, glasses. Find I think some there formulas. is something to lens tint uh, specificity for pickleball, uh, making sure that ball pops whether you're in an indoor or outdoor mm-hmm. uh, environment. Um, you know, with the sky as a backdrop or trees or mm-hmm. or court color. Mm-hmm. I think there are certain tints that uh, are specific to pickleball that you can't just go to uh, you know, any store and get the best looking pair of glasses. You want to get one that has um, the right uh, shape as well as tint for yeah. Good point. your environment. All right. So I wanted to briefly mention bags. So Volier and Six Zero both sent me their bags and they're both the tennis shaped 
bags, and I'm very happy to have them. I had I had a Selkirk bag before that, and it was it was their Pro Tour bag. Uh, I had that for a couple of years. Apparently, they've they've fixed some of the issues, but it but something about the zipper on that bag never really worked, so it drove me crazy. And I was so happy that Valer sent me a bag first, and I was using that. It's their that baby blue, you know, theme that their paddles use also, and the surface of it is kind of rubberized, so it has this pleasant feel, you know, similar to the the proton paddle surface. Mm-hmm. It feels very similar, it's kind of grippy, and yeah, plenty of compartments. And then Six Zero just released their bag, and they sent that to me as well. And Chris already mentioned, already talked about that in their latest podcast, and he's a big fan. He's switching over to that bag. And I use that today, you know, transferred my stuff into it. And it does have a lot more options, I'd say, than the Volaire bag in terms of the pockets and a little beefier. You can fit more paddles into it. It's got the the shoe insert in the bottom. It has a food insert similarly on the top uh, and really well made. It also has a rubberized surface. I got the black one. I think it looks good. You know, I'd say that the the Volaire is probably a flashier looking bag. It stands out more, you know. But uh, yeah, six zero did. They both did a fantastic job, and, and thank you for to both uh, for sending me those bags. Uh, but yeah, I could see myself using that six zero bag. We'll have to talk about at some point in a future podcast what we put in our bags yeah. for either daily play or for or tournament use. I have different bags for different things. I don't use one bag for everything. Um, you probably don't either. But we should get into that at some point. You've got you got a cool little bag that you use. It's actually one that I have not seen others carry around, and it's from Carbon. It's their sling bag. Um, it's not that additional piece that you get with their new tour bag, but it's a standalone product. It is fantastic for just grabbing two paddles uh, and heading to the gym. Mm-hmm. You know, you got enough room for a water bottle and a couple of balls, mm-hmm. a couple of paddles. Not much room for anything else, but yeah. for those quick trips. It flies over the shoulder so easily. It looks smart. It's, it's so functional. I love this bag. It was given to me as a gift, and uh, I really enjoy it. It looks nice. I always have envy of it when I pull out my 16 paddles from my 80-pound <laughs> bag, and you're walking around with this little sling bag. You need a bag with wheels, John. Yeah. Well, one bag I'm really excited to be released is uh, – Pickleball Will is working with ADV on a bag, and he and I had a Zoom call a couple of months ago, actually. He's been working on this for a while, and he has a lot of say into, you know, the specifications of the bag and, you know, all of the customizations and where the pockets are going and whether to add it's exciting. things here and there, and that thing looks sick. What's it's, the release date on that one? Uh, I think they've talked about it on their pod today, and it was released today, and... Uh, it's going through Kickstarter, so you know whether or not that's funded. I'm sure it will be, mm-hmm. but uh, uh, I I think he mentioned on our call that they're shooting for this summer, maybe earlier, maybe spring. So uh, shout out to Will. I think he's gonna hopefully send me one of those bags to Can't test wait out. To see it. Send two. Will. <laughs> <laughs> These are gonna be they're gonna be pretty posh bags, uh, just from what he was telling me. Oh, and one cool thing about them too, which which is a gripe I have with with every pickleball bag I've ever had is that the interior of the bags I have are black. Yeah. And you open it's up these big cavernous – Black hole. Yeah. You, you can't see anything in there. But, uh, yeah, he's using um, a brighter color on the inside. I would love to see that more. I never thought that it would be, like, a thing that I would care about. Right. But having that option is it's so handy because yeah. stuff gets lost down there and never to be seen again. Okay. What, where are we time-wise? Do we have time for a <laughs> Probably for a reader question? Um, yeah, let's move on to Q and A, our, our sort of last segment for today. I actually got into a conversation with somebody, an email conversation. Somebody emailed me through my website, and we just started geeking out about about different paddle metrics, and we got in, into a long conversation about power and pop. And one of the things that came up in this is is you know that given that I spend so much time testing paddles, there are a lot of things that are kind of intuitive to me that I don't realize aren't intuitive to everybody. So one of the things I brought up is that there is, with this gentleman, Jeff, I think is his name, um, is that there's a correlation between swing weight and power. And that makes sense, I think, to everybody. So basically, the heavier a paddle, the more weight in it, 
you're going to get more momentum and you're going to be able to hit the, the ball harder with it. And there is, I plotted it out. So I took my paddle database and I did a scatter plot with swing weight and with the power rating, so miles per hour the ball of serves I hit. And there's a positive correlation. Makes it's sense. not super tight, you know. There's there's some spread off of the, off of the trend line, but uh, I think the R squared was like 0. 0.06. So not extremely st- strong relationship, but definitely a positive correlation. But I think what's less intuitive, and, and Jeff mentioned this in the email, is is that there's a negative correlation between swing weight and pop. So in other words, the higher the swing weight of a paddle, the less pop you get. And that goes back to what we were discussing earlier that when you put lead tape on a on the perimeter of a paddle, even at the neck area, it's going to decrease your pop because that's adding some swing weight to it and reducing your ability to really get from a dead stop acceleration on a paddle. So testing paddle after paddle after paddle, I've just noticed this and it's become kind of ingrained in me that yes, a paddle that feels heavier is going to get better power and less pop. And when you add weight to a paddle anywhere above your hand, it's also going to reduce the pop and generally increase the weight, which is to bring us back to the grip paddles and the new gamma paddle, the airbender. That's the benefits, I think, of of putting weight at the base of the handle is that you're going to possibly be able to increase both power and pop that way. To an extent, we don't know what the threshold is where too much weight is going to be counterproductive in terms of those perks. So anyway, that was a fun conversation uh, that that I had. And it makes sense, too, when you think about it. Like if you gave a hypothetical example of a semi-truck and a smart car sitting on a line on a road and you put a giant pickleball in front of each of them, if you put the pickleball let's say 200 feet in front of them and both they both hit the gas at the same time, the semi-truck is going to make the pickleball bounce a lot further and faster than the little smart car, you know, just because it has a lot more mass behind it to create all that effect. But if you move that giant pickleball up to 10 feet away and you allow them to both press the gas, the smart car is going to be able to hit the ball further and faster than the semi-truck because the semi-truck will only pick up a few miles per hour at that point because it has it can accelerate less. At some point there's going to be a threshold where where the semi truck is going to surpass the smart car in terms of the velocity it puts on the ball even at lower speeds because of its greater mass. So it's the same with paddles, right? So the, the lighter weight paddles you're going to get more pop and the heavier weight paddles more power. That is not discussing the materials in the paddles, though. So that's where you get the variance off of that trend line. That's why it's not a perfect one-to-one correlation because the paddles have different materials in them. So as we talked about, air mid, Kevlar, cores produce more power, more pop, and face materials. Handle length also plays into this. There's There's a positive correlation also between handle length and power because you get more ability to leverage the paddle and hit the ball harder. So all fun stuff. That was a, that was a good conversation. So thank you, Jeff, for sending in a, you could tell he's educated and probably engineering because uh, he had a lot of good commentary to go with that. But I thought I'd bring that up and, and something that, you know, he mentioned was not so obvious is that negative correlation between uh, swing weight and pop. I would say that's probably not intuitive at all. Yeah. Because you think of, um, you know, those, those terms sort of in the same vein. Mm-hmm. Yeah, many times, and uh, clearly they're not. And I think you know that it's interesting too. I think Braden is working on his paddle database, and he is also going to be including power and pop metrics. And I'll be very interested to see how his compares to mine. And he's doing it the same way. I think I need to talk to him about it. But I, I saw a short video clip of him doing testing pop, and I think he's doing the same method that I'm doing, where you hold it on your chest and drop the ball and hit it that mm-hmm. way. So you're kind of limited. You can't really do a big backswing with, with it on your chest like that. So if he's using the same methodology, we should get fairly similar results. You know, we both have different, slightly different body mechanics and, and different ways of measuring the miles per hour. He has a, I called it the flux capacitor, his new machine. I forget what he's using, but that thing is, is really fancy. It's a large, large gun that measures spin and mm-hmm. speed. Um, and I'm, I'm using something to also measures exit velocity, but it's a much smaller, smaller radar gun that you can actually attach on a tripod. 
Yeah. What about those situations, John, when you're just simply holding the paddle stationary? You're not putting any forward mm-hmm. uh, momentum or force into uh, your defense or even your attack, but honestly is, is just holding it steady and letting the ball, the force of the ball uh, rebound uh, into your opponent's kitchen or back at them. Um, that is also pop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yet the measurements of that would be, I think, completely different than uh, a, a six inch or a one foot. That's a really good acceleration. point. That's There's a really no good point. Yeah. And I've, I've worked on measuring that too. Uh, I called it rebound and I set my paddle up in a vice. I got like a, a grip device that you can tighten and put that vice at the exact same distance from the top of the grip for each paddle. And I tightened it the same hardness, mm-hmm. the same tightness on each paddle. And then I dropped a ball from a meter above and I measured, and then I measured how far up the ball bounced. And it was totally backwards of, I shouldn't say totally backwards. It was very different than the expected results. So the you'd think that the poppier paddles would make the ball bounce higher in yeah. that circumstance, and it didn't. So you'd, you'd think, okay, the, the highest score for pop on my paddle database is the Pro Kinex Black Ace. That one was not the highest. The highest ended up being, I think, the Diadem Warrior and and one of the Pro Drive paddles that also has a very high swing weight. And I think what was happening is that the higher swing weight was causing the paddles, when they bend and return the energy into the ball, that higher swing weight was adding velocity to the ball simply by virtue of the mass, you know, of... of so that wasn't an effective experiment because it's not measuring pure pop. I think to do that, what you'd have to do is similar to kind of a coefficient of restitution test where you stabilize the paddle perimeter on a wall. So you kind of put, let's say, four rubber stoppers on a wall and kind of clamp the paddle to those stoppers so that it can't have any flex in the handle and fire a ball at that and measure measure the exit velocity of the ball off the paddle. I think that's the the best way to get at John I see an air cannon in your future <laughs> well I've got the ball machine the issue is it sprays balls you know it's not highly accurate in terms of where the where it hits exactly. each time that's a lot of it's going to be a lot of work to, to measure all of this but that's we'll see if I ever get around to it okay that brings us to the end anything else we should chat about looking forward to more time on the court off the court with you it's been a lot of fun these these first couple episodes and, and playing around on the court and testing different things and just looking forward to more of it. Yeah, me too. And we've we've committed to playing some tournaments together this year. Right. We've done it in the past. Uh, I'm going to do fewer tournaments, I think, this year than, than last year. I got kind of burnt out on, on tournaments when I finally did injure myself. I was like, God, I've played too many tournaments. I was actually kind of dreading yeah. the tournament I injured myself on. But I am revved up to, to play well, More we, tournaments this year. There are a lot of tournaments in this area in Colorado. And um, the thing is, you, you end up seeing the same people all the time at every tournament. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's almost like a roving gang of yeah. of pickleball folks, which is great. And, yeah. and there's room for that. But I'd like to get out of the area yeah. um, just to see different people and, and make sure you know we're not playing the person all the time. That yeah. We're playing just the best pickleball we can. Yeah, that's exactly right. You do see and play with the same people. And that was one of my... One of my goals, resolutions this year is to, to you know, I love the group of people we play with, but you do know each other's game so much that it kind of hinders your your growth in terms of, you know, learning the game. And it's always fun to play with with new people. And we've done a little bit of that. We've, we've traveled up to, to Loveland to, to play with that group. And mm-hmm. uh, I love it, though. I, I think we should, if you're willing, uh, to travel out of state for some tournaments. And, you know. Let's do it. Yeah, let's go. All right. All right. Good stuff, John. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Eddie. Take care.